John chapter 21 is the epilogue of John the Gospel. And that's the big word, your big word for this morning, kids, English lesson for the morning. What does, what is epilogue? Say it louder. I'm half deaf, I'm old and I'm half deaf according to my children and my wife. What is an epilogue? An afterthought of, of, um, an addition, right? Because you remember, if you remember last week's lesson, we read John chapter 20 at the end there, and it was um, Jesus appearing to the disciples in the locked upper room, right? And Jesus appeared to them, and it said at the end of that chapter, these things were written in this book so that you may come to believe. Sounds like an ending, right? Because it probably was an ending. And then somebody thought, it's not a good enough, so we have to add John chapter 21. So why did we have to add John chapter 21? What does it talk about? It talks about the disciples going back and doing what they knew. Right? Peter and Andrew, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, at least four of them that were there, were fishermen, right? By trade. Jesus called them from the sea, from their boats, to come and be with Jesus, to follow Him and to fish for men. So they... After seeing Jesus, how many times? At least twice. Maybe three times. We can talk about that one in a moment. Go back to what they knew. They forget about everything that just happened over the past three years. And they go back to fishing. And what happens when they go back to fishing? They catch nothing. Until this mysterious man shows up walking on the shore and says, do you have any fish? And they go, no, we didn't catch anything. Well, put your net out on the right side of the boat. You guys who fish, if you've been out for a while and you're fishing, do you really want to listen to somebody when they tell you, put your, put your line out on the right side? Of the... You, I know you've been out all night, but if you just do this right now, it's going to work. I guarantee it. And how many times does it work? I don't fish, so I can't tell you. So I'm probably not that often. But here's the, here's the man on the shore. He says, throw your net out the right side of the boat. And they do it. And they catch so many fish. How many fish? 153. Why 153? I don't know either. I'm wondering if somebody could tell me actually. It's a really big number. And there's so many fish that the net doesn't break, right? The net, they draw the net in. They don't have to mend it, right? Because when Jesus called James and John, they were in the boat with their father doing what? Mending the nets because the nets get torn when you fish, right? And this is different than throwing a line out there because you drag them in with the net. But Jesus tells them to throw it out one more time and and you're going to catch something. And they do it. But I don't think it's about the fishing. I really think it's about verse 14 where it says, and this was the third time. That Jesus appeared to his disciples after he had rose from the dead. And I don't know if that's necessarily the right number. Because let's look at the Gospel of John. And just look at the Gospel of John. Jesus appears first to who? The women. The women. No. Not the women. Somebody over here said it first the right time. Mary. It's only Mary in the Gospel of John. Because the Gospel of John chapter 20 says that Mary went early in the morning to the tomb to weep. And the stone was rolled away and she went back and she told the disciples and Peter and the disciple that Jesus loved went to the tomb. They looked in and they went home. And then Mary looked in, saw the men in white, turned around, saw Jesus. And Jesus said, don't touch me. Go to my disciples and tell them I'm sending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. So he appeared first to Mary. And then after that, on the night, later that night, he appeared to the disciples in the locked room, right? Without Thomas. So that's twice. And then a week later, he appears to the disciples again, right? Including Thomas this time. So that's... And now here he is on the shoreline. So this is actually the fourth time that he has appeared to the disciples. Unless John is not including Mary as one of the disciples, which could be the case. Again, that's not my take on it. That's Jesus' world time take on it. That Mary wasn't a disciple. But I believe Mary was the disciple. So this is actually the fourth time. And Jesus appears to them. And what are they doing? Exactly what they've always been doing long before Jesus ever showed up. So what has changed? What's changed? For them, nothing. 
which is actually really sad. But it's hopeful too. And why is it hopeful? Because last week we talked about doubts and one of the things that we didn't spend very much time on was how much we doubt that our faith is good enough. I hear it all the time from the confirmation parents, whether they know they say it to me or not. I hear it in the questions they ask and the way that they look when I tell them that they're going to be teaching their kids confirmation. I can see it in their eyes. I'm not good enough to do this. But I've tried to reiterate to them over and over again. Yes, you are. Because your children are going to learn their faith better from you than they are ever from me or any other pastor. Because we are all good enough to do what it is that God has called us to do. See, this is the fourth time that Jesus appears to his disciples. And they have now gone back to do what they've done before because it's what they know they're good at. They don't think they're all ready for this faith stuff. They don't think they're good enough to do what God has called them to do. And here's the good news in this this morning. And I don't know where this quote came from, so I can't say it, but it's not my words, but a quote. Scripture is the story of God's relentless pursuit of people who failed to trust His promises. Scripture is the story of God's relentless pursuit of people who fail to trust their promises. Because I guarantee you that if I was one of those 10, 11 disciples that was left, I would have gone right back out fishing with them. I would have gone back to what we were doing because we just don't get it. And it's hard for us to understand this. That this is about us being good enough to do what God has called us to do. And this chapter, this last chapter of the Gospel of John was probably added. This is my my thought on it. Was probably added because we needed to restore Peter, right? The big part to this whole chapter is Jesus pulling Peter aside, which it doesn't actually say, right? It just says that after they finished breakfast, Jesus addressed Peter. It doesn't say that they went off by themselves. It doesn't say anything about that. But it says Jesus addressed Peter and Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? How many words do we have in English for love? How many words are there in, in Greek for love? Three, there's unconditional love, there's brotherly love, and there's erotic love. Um, The last one's not in the New Testament. Um, Jesus asked John, do you agape me, which is unconditional love? And John replies, I brotherly love you. Jesus asked him again, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, I brotherly love you. The third time Jesus says, Peter, do you brotherly love me? And Peter finally gets it and says, Jesus, I agape you. Is it about Peter being restored? How many times had Peter messed up? How many? Lots. Because I can guarantee you it's more than three. He denied he knew Jesus three times, right? Right? When Jesus was arrested, Jesus says, you will deny me three times before the cock crows. I think I need more coffee. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. That's the three. But the interesting part to me is in John, this chapter 21, verse 14, he says this was the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he had risen from the dead. It doesn't say anything about Jesus moving away from, from the rest of the disciples. And he asked Peter, do you love me? Not once, not twice, but three times. So it was the third time that he appeared to his disciples. And each time they were, the first time they were behind a locked door. After they knew that he had rose from the dead. The second time they were still in that same room. It doesn't say the door was locked, but the door was shut. They were still shut away in a room. And the third time he comes to find them, they're actually finally out in the world, but they're doing what they've always done. They're not doing what Jesus has told them to do. Because when he met them in the, the upper room, he said to them, go into the world. As, I, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Don't stay locked away in this room. It's not about being in this room. Because we're all worried that we're not good enough. We're all worried that it's not, that we've never done enough. And we're never going to do enough. That it's about us being restored to God. And here's the thing. 
We're going to see it here in just a few minutes. This cute little boy right here who's going to fall asleep, I'm going to get to wake him up. I love making kids cry at this thing. At this thing. (laughs) Because right here is where it becomes enough. Right here is where Jesus names and claims each and every one of us. Right here is when that instrument of death becomes enough to make each and every one of us professors of faith and great apostles to go into the world and tell everybody about what God has done for us. Because it's not about us. It's all about what God did for us. Right here and right there. Actually, it should be the other way around. Right there and right here. Because it doesn't matter how messed up we are. It doesn't matter how many bumps or bruises, how many cuts or scrapes, what we've been through, where we've gone. It's all about what God has done for us, making us flawless. How many of you know the song, By Mercy Me, Flawless? Show of hands. I want to see him held up high because I only saw one hand over here. <laughs> really? I wish I had. I wish we had. I wish we had those screens, Robert. Screens right up here. We'd be watching a video right now. The chorus for the song "Flawless" by Mercy Me. And if you don't know it, I suggest you go and look for it. If you, if you, and this is not a plug for my blog at all, but it'll be posted on my blog here in about. 21 minutes. I didn't want it to post before the sermon. So the video will be posted on my blog at 10 o'clock. So go and watch it. But the chorus for the song is no matter the bumps, no matter the bruises, no matter the scars, still the truth is the cross has made you, the cross has made you flawless. No matter the hurt or how deep the wound is. No matter the pain, still the truth is, the cross has made you flawless. And one of the verses that I pulled out, because it's exactly where Peter was and exactly why this chapter has gotten written into John, because it, we had to restore Peter. That was the big thing. Peter denied Jesus and nobody ever restored him. But the fact of it is, is that Christ did restore him. When he went to that cross and did what he did for Peter and for every last one of us, that was enough to restore Peter. We didn't need this chapter because the 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 verses could it possibly be that we simply can't believe that this unconditional kind of love would be enough to take a filthy wretch like this and wrap him up in righteousness. That's exactly what he did. That's exactly what Christ did for each and every one of us, because it's not about how many times we would have to be asked. Right. Right. The title of the sermon this morning is how many times if Jesus had to ask you, do you love me for the number of times that you screwed up? How many times would he have to ask you? I got one hundred and fifty (laughs) three. Maybe that's the reason. There you go. I I think it would be more like one hundred and fifty three thousand. Or million, or Googleplex. A lot more than I ever want to count. But it doesn't matter because that right there is enough. For God so loved the world. You said it didn't fit today, but it does. For God so loved the world at one point in time. That he gave his only son to die for us and to make us be enough. To wipe away everything that we've ever done or ever will do. So follow him. Knowing that he's going to lead you down a path that's going to bring him glory. And let his righteousness and love be made known to the world. Not that it's going to be easy. Because none of the disciples had it easy. But he will always be with you. And you will always be good enough because that right there did it. No matter what they say or what you think, the day that he claimed you at that font, he made you flawless.